how it shows up in these awesome human beings' work. So if we can just begin by sharing your name and what organization you're in. Hello, my name is Bob Martin, and I'm with Clear Creek Creative in Rockets County, Kentucky. Hey, I'm Rachel Milford, and I'm with the County Wampus Public Council here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Hello, my name is Jared Bush, and I'm with the Knoxville, Tennessee. Storytelling as a kind of a vehicle for peace building, community building. 
So when I, when I came over to this country eight years ago uh, from Scotland and to go over and study at Duke and UNC and folklore, international development, strengthening the role of storytelling as a tool for peace building, and then I took over the International Storytelling Center in 2013. But still as an immigrant and a non-US citizen, I'm still not a US citizen, but I'm a green card holder. I decided that the country needs a little bit of help, so I decided to stay. <laughs> so, um, I think the context that I want to speak to is, is actually the context of the, the kind of economy and society that we're in. Um, so at the Highlander Center, I focus on uh, doing workshops and teaching popular education methodology. Um, how, do we, how do we bring people into the room? Share from their experiences of their of their uh, their experience living in this society, and figure out from those experiences like what what do we know what do we know about uh, the kind of world that we're living in the context that we're in and what how can we use that to change to change the world and um, and we're in the context of capitalism too um, capitalism the intersections of capitalism and societal patriarchy and white supremacy and ableism and these things that have brought us to this moment of like a really, uh, like a dire moment for our species, but also for the whole planet. Like that's also where the context. And, and our culture only values like what we can produce, like how we're productive. And, um, and like growth at all costs. You know, that growth at any cost, and extraction at any cost. And so I think when I think of collaboration, <coughs> Deep legacies and uh, histories and stories of resistance to that um, history and that context of that, that we're in, and uh, yeah, taking a stand, taking a stand that we're not we're not going to be compartmentalized, we're not going to be split apart. We're you know, in, in big and small ways, the ways that we resist the nonprofit industrial complex and competing for funding, figuring out ways to collaborate, like the folks on the panel that work that. That other folks are, are doing to uh, to work together and, and to center the communities that are most impacted by the system, um, and to refuse to like get into this competitive uh, production of the kind of mindset. So. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, on the previous panel, uh, they talked a lot about working outside of just the traditional art sector. Um, and so uh, we brought up that slides right into the next question of how has cross-sector partnerships impacted your work and the collaboration with people who thought to not be traditional arts organizations? You got something to say, Come on. <laughs> uh, I saw that in you, you talked about Like, like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start on uh, working across the sectors, different sectors, etc. So, story arts and our institution uh, really began as a folk arts institution. So, we saw the story as a folk arts. I still do, I do. And I think what Dudley spoke about, uh, and I think Dudley. 100% understand storytelling, and that's how I would see storytelling. It's, a, it's the essence of the community, it's the soul of the community. It's not branding, it's not marketing, it's not to kind of sell or compete or to get. Uh, and that's, but at the same time, over a almost uh, half a century, we've seen storytelling go from this sort of a respect for storytelling as a folk and traditional art to something that belongs to communities to something that become. Um, a way in which to advance uh, capitalist ideas to companies that want to learn how to tell the most compelling story so that they can sell their products. Um, and this is where I, I sort of, we get, we get lots of people coming to us and there's, there's opportunities. And I say, I'm going to say it to us, storytelling is almost like a Jedi force. It can be used both for good and for bad. 
can be used to win elections, it can get the wrong people into office, it can be used by fracking companies, but it can also be used to build community and prevent war and conflict. Uh, it can stop us from going to war and it can stop the war. And so I see it as that. Um, but the opportunity where we lie in our collaborative work is that everyone comes to us for those that are not artists. We get people from the Pentagon, from United Nations agencies, from um, uh, corporations, uh, TDA, and it all becomes opportunities to be at rural hospitals and turn these spaces, opportunities like the Turner Rural Hospital, which is one of our programs, into a storytelling cultural hub. And that's because, as someone talked about earlier, storytelling as medicine. It is medicine. It is so. So therefore, to be able to kind of work in those types of collaborations, we are seeing the benefit. And when we get, you know, uh, approached by groups that want to kind of use our skill sets and our kind of resources to kind of just get what they want or to be able to uh, manipulate communities, we we use the opportunity to sort of establish the, the idea of ethics of storytelling. So there's lots of different collaborative spaces that to which we work, and it kind of offers all sectors. So, so for about um, bringing communities of all types together across differences to to like uh, learn from each other and figure out what we know about the world and how we how we change it. Um, culture and art are like vital tools in our toolbox. And we all we all come from uh, from culture and like culture. I think like Kieran is saying, culture can be something that's produced for and commodified and like, produced for consumption and transactional. But uh, but it's also a source of resilience and just uh, our our people being people and connected to land and connected to each other. And um, and some of us have more healing to do to, to reconnect with our people and with our cultures. But I think culture can be, uh, and, and creativity and art can be, um, that source of resilience and resistance to, to assimilation into this, this culture and this system. Um, so it has to be a tool that we use uh, when, when we're bringing people together and also when we're, we're going about transformation of society. Um, so in terms of like cross-sector partnerships, uh, every time we have um, and then um, from from our uh, from our founding, the the artists and the cultural workers and the, and the women specifically and people of color um, have brought culture and art to the center and like made, made it a part of uh, all the workshops and education work that that women is doing. Um, and we we see it as like a core methodology um, that that cultural organizing. Sort of core to all organizing work, and we have to, if we're going to do organizing work, we have to do cultural organizing, we have to sit at it. Um, so, so, yeah, I think the, the work that um, people on the panel are doing is like, it's not about using art to say something about the world, it's not about using, it's not only about using art to say something about the world, but it's also about um, partnering deeply with communities and with people. Um, and understanding where they're coming from and using art as a way of unleashing the potential and the possibility and like expanding the imagination of what's possible um, and allowing connection and building um, strength and uh, res res resilience through that process. And I see that with everybody on the panel, the work that yeah. Jerry and Mitchell are doing on the panel and I see how they do that and they do a very good level on that. Hip hop is a 
platform that, that, we, that we choose to express ourselves through. But, but not all platforms are not so forced to do that. You know, our talent isn't really, um, isn't really like, set up for that. You know, so we gotta create these opportunities for ourselves. Right, so, um, so when looking at cultural organizers, it's, it's not just about art, it's about accounting for the whole individual, the whole person, right? Example, like a child right here, right? So if, if I'm gonna do an event, one thing about all the children accounting for, you know, is, um, is there food for people? Is there like baby, basic needs for people, you know? And we find those intersections and like find folks to work with that actually um, can support those needs, you know? Example, I had an event through a couple of, like last month actually, over in um, East Knoxville, over in, uh, in the Burlington area, it's a, it's a historic black area. It's, 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 I'm sorry, it's a historic business black area in our community. And um, for folks who don't know, my high school is like ranked really high in terms of black poverty, right? So we intentionally, as a collective, looked at working in that community, try to bring like, art in that space and actually to use that um, that um, particular event to really address that you know, poverty in our community. So we we work with artists, and not artists, but figures in that space, you know. Like, we work with folks that cook food that live in that area, you know, so. And, and Rachel should tell you as well, like when we totally see art in the area that, if you cook, you're an artist. If you, if you have, talk to folks, you're an artist in some kind of way, you know, it's art term. So, I tend to see everyone as artists. <laughs> so there's that. But yeah, you gotta just be open minded and you know, aware of that. There's a lot more needs in coming to a show and dancing and shooting, you know, folks like, Important to shoot me. The shoot me is very important. You gotta move. <laughs> but also, I might be some, you know, I might be hungry, you know. Or like, there, there might be some policies in my community that's not really supporting me to get the resources I need, you know. So you gotta, you gotta be open minded with that. We try to find a way to work with folks in that regard. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll echo, echo Jarius, because uh, we talk a lot, we've got pretty similar philosophies about a lot of stuff. Um, but what comes to mind for me is again this uh, this philosophy that everybody is an artist. I think it is incredibly important that we all have vehicles, mediums to tell our stories. We need everybody telling their stories right now, and we also need everybody imagining the futures that we want to create. We are in a time when we are imagining um, a world that has never existed that we know of. And you know, I think I work a lot with little kids. I work with elementary schoolers. I make art with them every week. And it's amazing to me, I've got five-year-olds that will get so hard on themselves, they'll start making a picture, and it is already set in so early to them that their art is no good, that they've messed up. I mean, I have kids breaking into tears over this stuff, and it, um, I see like all of our work, whether I'm making uh, giant puppets, like doing paper mache with adults, with elders who maybe never done visual art before, I'm working with kids, um, is helping them realize that they have really important stories, and whether they or they love writing poems, or they want to pursue hip hop or dance, whatever it is, or they want to cook, or they want to garden. Um, what is essential is that we need everybody in conversation and telling stories and listening and building relationships. Um, and so that crosses all sectors, whether Jace is putting on a hip hop show and we're talking about, yes, yes, everyone, whether we're talking about local politics um, or we're getting together uh, um, a nonprofit to make a puppet and to be building relationships with one another and be making art that they can use at their next event or the next protest they go through or their next action. It's just really important that um, we give people opportunities to find their creative voices and those mediums. So, yeah. I, I really appreciate what you all are saying. This, this, this through line of, of making art by, with, and for the communities that we are part of and, and helping um, ourselves and our world have greater access to the means of cultural production, for people to get better at telling our stories and to um, be stronger manifestors of the future that we want to live in, and not just be in a box where we're fighting against the future that we're in now. Um, and understanding that there's a time for that as well. Uh, the, the sectors that, the cross sectors that I find um, our work often um, intersecting with um, elder care, uh, education, of course, um, land-based sectors, environment, um, but in particular, sort of through this conversation, agriculture. So in our community, um, in Rockcastle County, 
um, not too far from Berea, Kentucky. There's not a lot of theater. Um, there's not a lot of people who go to theater, but there are a lot of people who eat food and then do a good job eating food and cooking food. And we come together on a regular basis around uh, family gatherings and, and funerals and reunions, and that's the culture spaces. That's, that's where it came from. And so we try to just dovetail all of our work around the work of our farmers and the work of the land and those stories that the land has to offer and, and how do we then make these models that are, you know, in, in, some, in some places might be, it might be a pejorative to say something like dinner theater, right? And, and I think reclaiming the idea that, that we eat together, we feed our mind, body, and spirits through our work, and that is work that we can do for the rest of our lives and we can always get better at. So that's what's coming for me. Um, in that vein, uh, I'm curious, um, what are some strategies or ways of working that you have found um, to be most useful in building authentic collaborations um, within the communities that you all work in? Work of those 
partners to, to, sh to show us all the world as countries. We said strategy, strategies. Um, what comes to mind uh, for me is play. So play is a strategy that we use in all of our work. Play is how we connect. Um, and this is world that we live in makes it really hard for us to play sometimes. There's a lot. There's a lot to be upset about. There's a lot to be greedy. Um, there's a lot of trauma happening, uh, continuing to happen on any given day, and. Uh, I see play as a really beautiful way to bring people together. I see it as incredibly healing and important for us to be doing this work. It has to be joyful and playful uh, to get people on board. Um, and I think we, we do that a lot in our work. I mean, I make big Columbus, so like, it's hard to make that serious. It's, <laughs> it's never really serious in the room that we come in when we walk into these things. Um, but just to give an example, last year, so we've done this annual community parade and block party for three years now. And last year, um, it rained on the day of our parade. And so we last minute ended up pulling our parade inside. We were in this big gym with the YWCA. And we turned the parade into a giant puppet fashion show. Great. Like you had your creation and you got to walk the runway and everyone just like hooted and hollered and sang for you. And then we had hip hop performers after that. We had like people making arts and crafts in the back. We had like a giant chest that it was really weird. And everyone just bought into it. I looked around the room and there's a bunch of noise from hundreds of people in the room. And I was like, oh my god, how do we get everybody to do this? To be playful, to be silly, to be just like connecting with each other. Um, and I think that can never be underestimated in how we build with one another, so, yeah. Theater practitioners, 
in Appalachia who don't have access to training but want to learn together in a, in a Skillshare and salon setting and a way for us to gather for a weekend once a year and just what are we working on, what works, what doesn't work. I, you know, when you're in the hustle of the nonprofit complex, you sort of go where you're told to go and you don't have time for a lot of stuff. And if you can just make that time of being with your community that is your family, that is your co-workers, your collaborators, it, it builds you throughout the year, it moves you in many, many ways. So food, transportation, child care, the use of story circles and everything that I do and gatherings of community on a regular basis. share a little bit more about the uh, cultural organizing triad and uh, to, to borrow from Wal Walla Mahana um, developed at the Highlander Center, um, which starts with a base, which is um, spirit and wellness. So what do we need to, to make our spirits well, and what do we need to be well ourselves? And, and really think that that's where we have to start, um, and, and that the cultural work and organizing work that we do um, starts there. Um, and then from there, like, how do we nurture our creativity and bring arts into the mix? Um, it's the next plank. And, and then the final plank is, what are the shifts and transformations and policies and practices that we can see having done the work of nurturing our spirit and, and our connectedness, bringing in creativity and, and art? Um, and yeah, so what do we want to shift in terms of policy and practice? Um, so yeah, I love I love the trial. It's like really simple and straightforward. But um, all the work that, that these folks are doing, like I can see the ways that it's kind of at the root and how it's useful. Yeah, so um, we have people from a lot of different places here gathered in the room. Um, and so I wanted to speak to or get you all to speak to um, the southern context. Um, from where you stand and how I feel like the history of the South is one of collaboration and so I'm uh, wanting you all to talk to uh, kind of where you're situated, what's the histories that you may be connected to that have given rise to collaboration in your practice. There's a part two to this question. <laughs> but we'll start here for so. Scottish. 
very left of Scotland, and if that makes any sense. Um, but I moved to the United States eight years ago and straight to North Carolina. And then I moved to East Tennessee six years ago. And I never thought that, you know, I do a lot of stuff, and I work a lot in DC and New York and San Francisco giving talks and storytelling, etc. I never thought I'd end up defending the South as I do. And I do. And I and I think, you know, this country is um, and I think you all know it's kind of it's still um, suffering to some extent from the legacies of, of uh, slavery, civil war, Jim Crow. You can see it in the political map, you can see it in the cameras of the system poverty that exists within our nation. Um, I think we had our conversation really, I think, you know, there's, there's so much that the South can teach and should teach the rest of the nation. And I think, um, and I'm not going to, just from an example, I'm not, I am an artist, but I would say I'm an arts administrator. I apply it when I'm an administrator of thinking and envisioning a space or a program or a project. I, I still think as an artist. And so when I'm planning a festival, 11,000 people coming together to share a space together for three days, then I also think that we're not, not in New York, we're not in San Francisco, we're out in the US South. And what can happen in that space is that people can sit together of every political spectrum, cultural spectrum, age demographic. One person can wear an NRA cap, and they can sit next to someone wearing a Bernie t-shirt, and that is good. That is the opportunity. So in this space, it's not, it's not to um, try to convince them how to think. It's to remind them of where they come from, collectively. And that, the idea that the story of this country is made up of many new, many complex stories, hilarious, poignant stories, uh, infuriating, but it's complex and there's no one single story that makes up this country. So when I'm thinking about, thinking about the place that we are, the opportunity that we already have, I and mean, then you can do so much more when you're in that space. So yeah, we do layer in ideas around immigration or topics and allowing people to sort of give the opportunities to hear the perspectives of different people that have historically had that chance to have their story told on a main national stage. So we think about planning and that process, etc, etc. But thinking of the space that we already have and those cultural spaces and in the world we did in Northern Ireland, the art galleries, the museums, in a 30 year war became known as the Oasis of Calm. Why? It's because it was one of the only spaces that you could meet your neighbour in a safe space and interact on a natural level in that in the opportunity. And we have very sometimes, and I, and I kind of fear this country is going into what happened in Northern Ireland, the troubles, a 30 year war. We're kind of emerging into that right now. So I was thinking about those spaces, the festivals, the events, the museums, the art galleries, the programs we do to kind of uh, allow people to feel safe and also to share their stories, all types of stories, the ones that make us angry too. So when I think of the South, I think of contradictions. Um, and I think contradictions are a beautiful place, uh, an opportunity for healing, an opportunity for dialogue, an opportunity for um, exploring possibility and, and just opening. Um, and uh, like one of the contradictions I see is um, like um, like we've heard uh, the history of extractive industry in, in, our, in the South um, and the prevalence of state violence and at the same time culture and, and communities that, that have lived and still have practices of resisting state violence and resisting um, commodification and like, providing for them Cells in a self reliant way and like not, uh, not being so reliant on capitalism in the market. And so I think there's something in, in my work teaching about solidarity economy, we talk about the, the new economy that we need to build that's beyond capitalism. It, it needs to be populated with so many different uh, models and ideas. And a lot of those already exist, a lot of those already exist here in the South. So I think we have a lot, a lot of fertile ground to build on in, in the midst of those contradictions. 
And one more thing is lack of funding. Uh, I think especially in nonprofit and philanthropic sector in the South, is, I think that's something that we're struggling with now, is like um, a lot of philanthropic dollars don't come here. They don't get, they don't get here. Um, yes, yeah, so South. Uh, so I was born in Green Cities, Tennessee. Um, so I've been here for a while. I was also born and raised Jewish in East Tennessee, which was a funny experience. And there's not, we have a very small Jewish community here. So we had kind of like thrown um, into communities that were my own. <laughs> it was like a really, really experience for me. I think. You want to switch? Um, yeah, I think there is a lot that we can learn from the South, the rest of the country can learn from the South. I think there, as folks have already spoken to, there is an inherent need to collaborate in this region for a sheer amount of resource. We don't have spaces to perform in. We don't have spaces to even use the studios to make in. Um, so how are we being creative? How are we working together? Um, so there's definitely a need for that. And, and like, you know, as Bobby was saying, that's the culture that we're trying to Right? We're trying to shift away from white supremacy culture, um, from individualism, from productivity, like all of these things. And so moving into this paradigm of collaborating um, is also where we need to go. So it's already happening here, and it's also really hard just because we have to do it here. And our community is a lot doesn't mean that it's easy. I think it's like easy to get up here and romanticize collaboration, but it's really hard. It's really hard to be in community with people. It can be really challenging to create in community with people. And um, it's a really beautiful process. And part of going through that process of learning how to be in community and collaborate is that we all get to heal and shift a lot of stuff for ourselves, right? So that we can be in a relationship with people that are really different from us, with people whose people, whose ancestors may have hurt us, or our ancestors may have hurt them and done violence to them. And so how we like just bringing us into that space together um, and going through that process begins that process, right, that we need to do. So, um, I lost my train of thought. But <laughs> there's a lot to learn from here, and it's also, we still have a lot to learn here about how we build together, and it's totally possible. The first theater piece that Jerry and I did together, um, we had like 50 different people involved in it, making art, we brought together hip hop, and puppets, and dance, and theater, and people were like, what are you doing? <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but yeah, it's possible, we got, we got a lot to learn too. Um, <laughs> trying to see what I can add. Uh, I think Rachel said most of what I was thinking. Like in that corner, um, uh, the biggest thing about working in the South, um, I believe, yeah, is that um, there's not a lot of resources in our community in particular. So, again, like, obviously, collaboration is key. You know, I think Carl Connect here, for example, is a huge resource for us. And just uh, doing work we can just, um, just to be like the beat that we. <laughs> We may not be able to uh, achieve on our own, you know, to find those relationships. And I think that's one, one is a challenge, but also makes the South special, you know, having uh, big funding like, groups around us to support us, simply. So it, it makes us be creative and think outside the box. So um, we have time for a couple of questions. And so if you have a question, um, Offer it up. I don't know your name. Kieran. Kieran. Hi, Kieran. 
um, is around how do we build this community arts yoga festival, but also add activism where we can all sit together and share. And it's not so much about your spirit or your wellness, but it's about the overall wellness of people. So I, I guess I want to explore a little bit more about how important wellness is, and, and not just like, oh, I have, you know, I feel well, but how sick the world is, without saying how sick the world has become, and, and how do we dive a little deeper um, and, and sort of explore that space? That's a big question, <laughs> but I think the youth one is a really important one. Um, and I, maybe, I don't know, I'm just ripping off this now, because it was a question I wanted to ask at the end of the last session, I thought it wasn't really maybe appropriate at the end of that session, but it was something that, a conversation I had with someone recently, um, um, maybe in the era of 50s and 60s and 70s, the activism was very clear, precise. But today, it's so confusing. Which cause do you support? How do you support it? We also live in a globalized world. You know, I spend two days over Thanksgiving weekend uh, contacting partners in India because of what's happening in India with President Modi and the uh, demonization to Kashmir people. And I'm of Indian heritage, and I feel it's my role to do that. But I'm also collaborating with some colleagues in the Middle East. And, and then I'm thinking about oh, how I support Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for the Future movement, which I want to do as much as possible. So I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I think there's more recognition now with uh, the early experiences that we have that lead to the society that we have today, uh, ACEs, and the understanding of the traumatic experiences that we have in our early childhood, or that can come from before. But I kind of think of that as like. We can never really fully really understand the completeness of who we are until we've grappled with our early traumatic experiences to understand who we are as a human being. But same goes for a nation. A nation can never really understands its full completeness of its story until it grapples with the legacies of its early years trauma. So that it starts from its slavery, its birth its beginnings, its foundations, and it's kind of what Bernice King, Dr. Bernice King said a couple of years ago, a few years ago, the one Dr. King, when she came to Johnson City, Tennessee, she said, there's something that Donald Trump and Black Lives Matter have in common, and that is that both phenomenons have woken this country up to the great disparities that already exist, and it's why the arts and culture and storytelling matters. And, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, it's an uncomfortable for a lot of people, but uh, I don't know, I'm not sure, quite sure how to fit it. I approach it, I'm a sick, so I approach things from my, my upbringings, my spirituality, but that's just a personal thing for me. But I think uh, trying to get the essence of, uh, when I'm in storytelling workshops, going beyond the surface level of our story, but going deep into the joy and the suffering. When Michelangelo painted the Sixteen Chapel, he didn't learn to paint in a one-hour workshop on how to paint. <laughs> he learned the techniques of painting, and then he learned how to break the rules, then he learned the application of soul. If you want to create a masterpiece, then you learn the rules, you learn to break it, then you learn to have to apply your joy and your suffering. And then you can get to the place of creating that masterpiece. If we want to create a masterpiece in this nation, collectively, the most beautiful story of how we overcame these greatest challenges that we have, of course, you know, the rise of fascist regimes and the climate emergency, then we need to uh, think about the application of our soul and maybe our spirituality. Do we have another question? Sunny the Parade is going to be on May 16th, 
So you got lots of time to get ready. Okay. You got. It. You did not miss it. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> There's a
Yeah, create more opportunities for folks to be aware of their value and their worth, you know, in a, in a place where, uh, where they can access the resources they need to actualize the ideas that they may have, you know, create the work they want to see as well, you know, so it's my vision. So the word economy becomes uh, really, it's etymology, what it comes from is uh, take care of your home. So I, when I think of my vision for the South, I think of, I think of my home um, being from the South, and I think of, like, folks have already said, how do you take care of our um, collectively? And I think one step in that direction is healing the Southern impression that I think we all carry with those of us from the South, and, that, and that's internalized by us being from the South, but also internalized in New York um, and other places in the, in the world. Um, that there's something wrong with the South, that there's something wrong with us, there's something wrong with this land, there's something um, that we have to fix. And, and I think we know that our story is about like, the story of the whole nation and, and of empire in general. And so I think if we take one step and kind of healing from being the scapegoat for racism and the scapegoat for empire, um, then I think we'll be one step closer to figuring out how to take care of each other, make sure everyone's on that here, take care of our own. Okay, so how long, because I I feel I haven't lived here, I've been here long enough to take this one. So have to answer that question as a subject of the world. But, uh, Maybe just got really to build on all the things that you've said. And there's something, I don't know, which means think about teach the next nation how to be kind. I'm a staunch liberal, but I think liberals can be really mean. Mm -hmm. And especially then, maybe, and I'm saying this with people, we can be very mean to those that are different from us politically. And I think, you know, with really, something that's taught me about where I live in East Tennessee compared to where I was in Chapel Hill before that a conservative community can be very welcoming and very inclusive and very open to those with different political viewpoints. Sometimes more than my own set of friends can be to those with different diverse views. And I think it comes from not just within the South, it's working class values, it's rural, mountain, there's many, many components of that. And I think there's a building on that, I think is a really beautiful thing that views. I choose to live here as an immigrant, not not. It's by place I choose to. I love the richness of culture all across the southern states where I visit. The richness of traditions, the soul that exists, the histories, the complexities. The only thing I would say I'd love to see very important in the future is a, 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 an opening up and a witness and observing, maybe sort of an acknowledgement of how we came to the place that we are today. And that includes things like our indigenous peoples have been treated, including and how we explore the issues around slavery and the legacy of slavery and racism today. And I think also see contested spaces in the South in the way that um, Germany and the Third Reich have reinvented its narrative. Places like Northern Ireland, we explored opportunities for coming out of the new war. Places, so thinking about it as, you know, not to ignore it, to face it, also use an opportunity to have a conversation, just like Brian Stevenson is doing, inviting a national conversation with his work. I think we could be doing that in the South a lot more, and I, I love, and I think it's a beautiful place in all aspects and completeness, but it's still a beautiful place where it is now, too, as well, it's traditions. So, thank you all. Um, for your questions, and thank you all panelists. And can we give a special round of applause to our new addition to the panel? Mr. Evan Lewis.